Sadness and outrage tonight after another school shooting in America. Good afternoon, this is News 2, and we're following a breaking story today of shooting at a high school in Littleton, Colorado. There is word potentially multiple children have been killed. This happened at the Robb Elementary School in the Uvalde Consolidated Independence School District. The 12th Colorado Movie Theater Massacre. Seven bodies were discovered in Oklahoma. Two mosques in Christchurch were targeted, the country's worst mass shooting ever. Hi everyone, I sincerely hope you guys are still enjoying the Halloween series. Today is part 4, and we will be talking about a very disheartening case in this video. Remember to subscribe to my channel if you enjoy this video. With that being said, let's get into the case. We're all familiar with the horror and slasher film genre. They usually involve a masked killer going on a violent killing spree. While most of us spend our Halloween nights watching these spooky films, Halloween Night in 1984 turned out to be a real-life horror movie for one woman named Doreen Herbert. Doreen Ray Herbert was born in Santa Clara, California on November 29, 1952. She grew up with a tight-knit and loving family. Doreen was a generous person through and through, devoting her life to helping people. She became a physical therapist, and around the same time, she met and started to date a man named William Michael Dennis, who went by Mike. When he began to date Doreen, Mike was employed as a machine operator at the nearby Lockheed factory. The two only dated for a few months before they tied the knot in 1975. It wasn't long until they welcomed a baby boy, who they named Paul Dennis. The stress of parenthood quickly wore down on their relationship, which soon turned into a divorce in 1997. Doreen and Mike went through a bitter court battle, which resulted in Doreen gaining full custody of Paul. While Doreen did have primary custody of their son, Mike was still able to see his son on weekends. Mike cherished the time he was able to spend with Paul, but he was reportedly still resentful about the divorce. Doreen did not feel the same way. In fact, she got over the divorce rather quickly. Within two years, she met and married another man, Charles Herbert, who owned a local carpet store. The two of them welcomed a baby girl on November 26, 1979, and named her Deanna Herbert. Doreen and Charles raised both Deanna and Paul together. Sadly, hard times soon fell on the blended family. One year after Deanna was born, in 1980, the nearly four-year-old Paul fell into the family's swimming pool after he slipped through the fence surrounding it. Doreen was home at the time, but she unfortunately didn't notice that Paul was in the pool until it was too late. When he was discovered, he was quickly pulled out of the pool and transported to the hospital. He was put on life support, where he stayed for a week, but he sadly passed away three days after the respirators and feeding tubes were removed. Obviously, the entire family was devastated over Paul's death, but his biological father, Mike, seemed to take it the hardest. He was quick to blame Doreen for their son's death, even filing a wrongful death lawsuit against both Doreen and Charles. The trial for this case started in March of 1982. The jury ended up ruling in the Herberts' favor, and they swiftly cut contact with Mike after the trial. Following his loss, Mike reportedly went into his lawyer's office, curled into a fetal position, and let out a wailing scream. Mike reportedly told a co-worker that he believed Doreen killed Paul, that she wasn't watching him, and she didn't do enough to save him. After his young son's premature death, Mike spent the following years drowning in depression. His mental health during this time had deteriorated significantly. Sometime in October of 1984, Mike lost his position at Lockheed and was forced to take a salary reduction in order to not get laid off. His pay was reduced from $13.53 per hour to $10.99 per hour. Mike acted civil towards his new co-workers but he was not happy about the situation in the slightest. The bitterness he felt against Doreen only grew over time, not only over the divorce, but now also festering over little Paul's death. Mike's life was getting worse and worse, but the same couldn't be said about the Herberts. In 1984, they finally received some much needed good news. After two previous miscarriages, they found out that they were expecting another child, this time a son. This new baby was due in early November, just after Halloween. As the due date approached, 
Doreen's sister joked with her saying she was as wide as she was tall. After all, Doreen was under five feet in height. October 31st, 1984, finally rolled around, and Charles spent the night trick-or-treating with four-year-old Deanna. Doreen, now heavily pregnant, decided to stay home, to hand out candy to the other children in the neighborhood. Eventually, Charles and Deanna made their way back to the house, and when they got back, Doreen took Deanna out to hit a few extra houses to end the night. When they returned, Charles went out to the liquor store. Before he left, he told Doreen that it was getting late, and that she should think about closing the house up for the evening. Charles later estimated that he was only away from the house for about 15 minutes. Around 9 p.m., Deanna remembers hearing a loud knock on the door. Years later, she recalled the knock, quote, It didn't sound like a regular knock. It was a little more aggressive. When Doreen opened the door, there was a man in a wolf mask holding a machete standing just outside. Deanna recalls that the man then said, quote, I'm going to kill you, as he stepped inside of the home. Deanna later testified at trial that her mother demanded the person to get out of the house and told her to run and hide behind the couch. About 15 minutes later, when Charles returned home from the store, he noticed that the front door was unlocked. When he made his way in, he found a horrific scene. Blood was spattered on the walls, ceiling, and furniture, covering the entire room. He saw Doreen lying near the entrance, with a massive pool of blood surrounding her body. Just a few moments later, Charles saw something in the living room. It was his eight-month-old fetus, who had been removed from Doreen's abdomen and hacked into pieces. At first, Charles thought that this scene was the result of Doreen suffering a miscarriage, but then he noticed a severed hand laying close to the fetus. It was Doreen's. Charles did everything that he could to stop the bleeding, holding her wrist tightly. It was then that he noticed all of the cuts on her neck and stomach. Charles was now frantically looking for their daughter, Deanna, who was still hiding. As he was searching for her, he slipped in the enormous amount of blood on the floor. Eventually, he found Deanna still alive, cowering behind the couch. He brought her into the kitchen so she would hopefully not have to see the horror in the living room. Charles proceeded to dial 911, but the call wouldn't go through. Instead, he called the fire department for help. Charles stayed by Doreen's side, attempting to tend to her wounds until first responders arrived. When police and paramedics ultimately arrived on the scene, they discovered Charles covered in blood, completely hysterical. Arriving with the first responders was retired San Jose Police Department Detective Bert Caro, along with former San Jose police officer Jaime Saldivar. Saldivar recalled the scene, describing it as, quote, completely, completely eerie, completely bizarre. On the porch, next to the front door, authorities found a wolf mask. From this area, they were able to follow a trail of blood that led all the way down the block, where it suddenly stopped. They assumed that the killer probably got into a car at this point, which is why the trail disappeared. They collected samples of the blood, but at this time in the 1980s, they were only able to identify the blood type, which wasn't extremely helpful from the get-go. Back at the house, Doreen was surprisingly still alive. She was loaded into an ambulance, but she unfortunately died on the way to the hospital. When Doreen's body was examined, they found an immense number of wounds around her entire body. The most prominent ones that they discovered were severe gashes to her abdomen, uterus, placenta, and the umbilical cord. She also suffered multiple cuts on the left and right sides and the back of her head. Some of these cuts even fractured her skull, penetrating about two inches into her brain. Her left hand was severed from her body just above the wrist. She also suffered numerous gashes to her back, including a gaping wound that exposed her bone. Severe lacerations were also discovered on the front of Doreen's torso and her legs. The eight-month-old fetus was also examined. He suffered from multiple chopping and slashing wounds. I won't go into grave detail, but he had numerous wounds all over his body. He had cuts to his head, shoulders, chest, abdomen, and legs. One of his legs was also severed from his body. Heartbreakingly, doctors would later determine that the baby would have likely lived if just born prematurely but he had no chance of surviving after the trauma his body suffered. Unsure of the situation, authorities detained Charles for questioning. Another team of officers went around to the Herbert's neighbors to try and collect information. 
Many told them that they had seen a man dressed like a wolf walking around the neighborhood around the time of the killing. During the questioning, police learned of the tumultuous history that the couple had with Doreen's ex-husband, 37-year-old William Michael Dennis. This is also when they learned of four-year-old Paul's death, which prompted them to make their way to Dennis's house. They arrived shortly, as Dennis lived less than two miles away from the Herberts. When they got to Dennis's house, they made a frightening discovery. Detective Caro said, quote, I remember there's a truck in the driveway, and I just, with a flashlight, I look in, and we see blood on the steering wheel, and on the key, and on the gear shift knob. The police knocked on Dennis's door, and while they didn't get an immediate answer, they saw lights on in the home, and heard the sound of running water. Officer Saldivar later said, quote, We all looked at each other, and the first thing I thought, which everybody thought, was somebody's trying to flush or wash away evidence. Police had county communications call the home to inform Dennis that police were there to speak with him. They continued to knock on the door louder and louder. Finally, after a long wait, Dennis answered, wearing a robe. Authorities informed him of Doreen's attack and murder, to which he seemed surprised. They asked if he might have any knowledge that would help them find her attacker, which he denied. Dennis then invited the officers to come inside to talk. Upon entering, they noticed that Dennis was wearing a blood-soaked bandage on his right hand, which Dennis explained away by saying he had gotten the injury while playing with one of his knives. He said that he had been flipping it in the air and accidentally caught it by the blade. Investigators asked if he would allow them to perform a search on his home, to which he replied that he had nothing to hide, granting them permission. While they looked around the home, Officers noticed blood in various areas of the house, as well as on articles of clothing and objects. The amount of blood that they found was far more than what would have been produced by a simple knife wound. Detective Caro recalled, quote, I see all this gauze, all this blood, and I say, you're under arrest for murder. So I handcuffed him. Police then conducted a second search of the home, this time taking extra precautions to make sure to search the house thoroughly. They ended up locating a receipt from a local hardware store and a label for a machete with an 18-inch blade. Police knew that Doreen's wounds were inflicted by some sort of large blade, so this 18-inch machete seemed promising. Unfortunately, they never were able to locate a murder weapon. In the garage, police found drops of blood near the washer and dryer, as well as a trail of blood that led outside. I also saw that they found two handmade coffins inside of the garage. Multiple sources stated this, but not all did. Also in the garage were a few body bags, weights, and a map of the San Francisco Bay. After finding this evidence, authorities were safely able to conclude that Dennis was likely planning to kill both Charles and Doreen before dumping them in the bay. During the search, they examined Dennis's truck closer. They found blood on the ignition switch, on the radio switch, on a piece of rope inside of the truck, on the seat back rest, and on the steering column. They also found a drop of blood on the seat, and another under the gas pedal. They could tell that some areas of the truck, like the door and window, were wiped off recently. After his arrest, Dennis waived his rights and agreed to a taped interview. He said that he had been home since finishing work at about 4 p.m. He stated that the only time he stepped outside was to hand out candy to the kids that were trick-or-treating. Dennis adamantly denied being responsible for the murder of his ex-wife, and even though the police had found all of the evidence in his home, it was not enough to hold him. Dennis was released from their custody after 48 hours. Only a few days later, on November 5, 1984, Dennis's blood type was matched to that found near the crime scene, so he was subsequently re-arrested. He was charged with murder with special circumstances, which made him eligible for the death penalty. I'm assuming they tested the blood found in the truck and home as well but I didn't see any articles mention the findings. Luckily, police were further able to connect Dennis to the crime. They discovered that the wolf mask found at the scene belonged to Dennis, and he had worn it to a Halloween party the year prior. Police talked to someone who attended the previous year's Halloween party, and she said, quote, Last year we went to this party. He was dressed as a big bad wolf. Detective Caro spoke with the woman, quote, Crossing my fingers, I said, Did anybody take pictures by any chance? To which the woman replied, Oh yeah, the guy took tons of pictures. Thankfully, they were able to obtain the photo, and they matched the mask in the picture to the one they found at the scene. 
Dennis's trial began in July of 1988. During the trial, Dennis reportedly did not contest his identity as the killer. Dennis's lawyers argued that the grief of losing his son drove him mad, that his actions were due to a mental illness, and were not planned. They said, quote, this was the explosion of the mind rather than a carefully conceded plot. They also brought up the fact that after his son's death, Dennis had to transition to a less prestigious position at his job, which also affected his already shoddy mental health. Four years had passed since the murder, and Doreen and Charles's daughter, Deanna, was now eight years old. She testified in the trial, recalling the events of that Halloween night. She said, quote, My mommy said, get out of my house. My mommy told me to hide behind the couch, so I did. The prosecution relied primarily on the evidence collected during the investigation. The wolf mask along with a similar 18-inch machete were shown in court. They also produced some neighbors that stated they had information regarding the attack. One of Erber's neighbors, Don Isbell testified that he and his two children went trick or treating around the neighborhood that evening. He said that they stopped at the Herbert's house at about 7 p.m. As they left, Isbell said that he noticed a man in a wolf mask resembling Dennis's mask. He said that this man was standing in the street, staring at the Herbert's home. Another neighbor, Manuel Gonzalez, testified that he also saw this masked man standing across the street from the Herbert's home. The defense presented friends and associates to testify on behalf of Dennis's character, childhood difficulties, and the immense love he had for his son Paul. Dennis didn't personally testify during any part of the trial. Dennis was ultimately found guilty of first-degree murder for the death of Doreen, and second-degree murder for the death of her unborn fetus. The next year, in September of 1989, he was sentenced to death by the gas chamber. Years would pass without his execution happening. In 2016, propositions to reform or abolish California's death penalty were presented. Dennis's story came back up in the news during the time. Doreen's daughter, Deanna Scott, said during an interview with a Bay Area news reporter, quote, I can forgive, but I can't forget, and I think he should get the death penalty. In an interview with the Lake County Record B, Charles stated, quote, I want him to know we survived, and we're making it. He hasn't conquered us. Charles and Deanna say that they have both forgiven Dennis for the death of Doreen and the unborn fetus, for their own peace of mind. The death penalty didn't end up being abolished in California, so as of this video, nearly 39 years after the murder, William Michael Dennis is still sitting in San Quentin State Prison, awaiting his death. Doreen Herbert was 31 years old at the time of her horrific murder. She was a kind and generous woman who loved her family deeply. She left behind a grief-stricken husband and heartbroken daughter who will never forget about her. They also lost their soon-to-be son and brother in the process. I feel horribly for both of them. No one should ever have to go through that pain. Please take a moment to think about the victims in today's case. Thank you for sticking through the video. I sincerely hope you guys are enjoying the daily uploads. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you like my content. And also please don't forget to like and comment, it really helps with video engagement. I'm interested to hear what you all think about this case, so please do let me know. Until next time, stay safe.